Customer service done right can be your company's single biggest competitive advantage. Welcome to the customer service revolution. Join customer service authority and best-selling author John DeJulius as he interviews leaders who are revolutionizing their industries. This is more than a podcast, though. It's a movement. The customer service revolution is a radical overthrow of conventional business mentality designed to transform what customers and employees experience. If you are a revolutionary customer service leader who's ready to stop competing on price and obsessed with building a brand that people cannot live without, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the Customer Service Revolution Podcast. In this week's episode, John speaks with Fred Reicheld, best-selling author and the creator of the NPS, Net Promoter Score. Their conversation is around Fred's newly released book, Winning on Purpose, the Unbeatable Strategy of Loving Customers. In this episode, you'll learn how NPS has been adopted by two-thirds of the Fortune 1000, why he feels NPS is broken, and why he needed to write a new book to address what companies and leaders are doing wrong. The most common misperceptions that people and companies have about NPS how we should define what constitutes a great company, and what earned growth rate, EGR, is, and why do we need it. Now here's your host, John DeJulius. Hello, revolutionaries. This is John DeJulius, Chief Revolution Officer of the DeJulius Group, and welcome to another podcast of the Customer Service Revolution. Today I am thrilled, honored to have Fred Reicheld with us. Welcome, Fred. Thank you. Good to be here. And I'm sure you know who Fred is, but let me just give you a little more context to it. When you think of Fred Reicheld, he is the inventor, creator, father, gave birth to the net, at the time, net promoter score, NPS. And his book, he's written several best-selling books, but his book, The Ultimate Question, 2.0, the net promoter, companies thrive in a customer-driven world, has just changed. There's very few books and very few people that have an impact the way Fred Reichel has done. So really excited. And I I, I didn't know this, and I've been following uh, Fred for, for 25 years, that he is from Cleveland grew up in Cleveland. And that's just another example. We always say Cleveland is the customer service capital of the world. And, you know, we got people like Fred and James Gilmore and the DeJulius group. So uh, we got that connection. All right, Fred, let's get after. I got so many questions and I have ADD, so I'm going to bounce around. You know, you invented NPS um, almost 20 years ago. Two thirds of Fortune 1000 companies use it. You know, the world's leading customers say, all our clients use it. We tell them to use it. To me, that's a mic drop moment, right? Go off into the sunset. You've made history. But you had an epiphany and something uh, got you to come back and revisit it. Uh, you want to tell our listeners what that was? Yeah, I was I, mean, I was pleased, of course, that so much of the world has adopted NPS, um, the, the score and the broader system that's uh, evolved in our open source community. But frankly, I think most people misuse it today. Some even abuse it terribly. So the reason for writing Winning on Purpose is to, to sort of clarify what the, the core purpose was behind this net promoter idea to show how people are going wrong, even with the best of intentions, and then lay out some of the best practices that I see in superstar companies who really have changed the world with a net promoter philosophy. Yeah. And so the reason, one of the reasons why we have uh, Fred on is because he just wrote his new book, Winning on Purpose, The Unbeatable Strategy of Loving Customers. You know, at first I read about this in a Harvard Business Review article titled uh, Net Promoter 3.0. And I'm kind of like, well, you know, what else can you do to this thing? And I was reading it and I was just like, reached out to you and said, I got heavy on. Then I, I, I got the book and I have it, Fred, I have it on, on hard copy. I have it on Kindle. And I also have the audio version on Kindle. This is how I overdose on a book as I'm reading, I'm listening to it. And there's just so many great things. And, uh, you know, I'm going to get into them, but 
can't believe anybody's not familiar with Net Promoter, but Net Promoter score, uh, Net Promoter system is the best black and whites way to measure customer satisfaction. And again, it's been it, it's used by two thirds of the Fortune 1000 companies. But I have recognized what you're saying is it's it's become something that people can game. It's become something that people have incentivize, which then has unintended consequences. Uh, tell us about that, Fred. Yeah, I've always uh, discouraged people from linking net promoter scores to frontline team results or individual results, especially, uh, because then it's it's all about the score. It's not about using that feedback to learn how to serve customers better. You know, I, I'll, I'll make sure I sell this. <laughs> I'll get the deal closed. Right. And then I'll try and uh, do damage control by giving them free car mats or oil changes or <laughs> free haircuts to, you know, whatever it takes to get a 10. Yes. And, and that just, it, it's sad. But think about, you know, what would happen to profit accounting, you know, reported accounting if you didn't have any rules? You know, people go to jail if you fudge the numbers and yep. sort of fudge the system. That's not true in, in a NPS world. People can fudge the scores and play, plead and beg, and, and they do, and it destroys destroys the usefulness of the feedback, and it, it destroys the dignity of the server and, 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 the, and the error honesty, and, it, and if the customer has a worse experience because it's very clear, oh, this isn't about me making my experience better as a customer. This is about you. You need a score, and, and, and essentially it destroys 90% of the potential value. And I've heard these stories work with you know, so many consulting clients that have used it. And then what happens is whatever our interaction is, you know, face to face online. And I know you're not happy. So somehow I, you know, mistype your email. So you can't get the debt promoter score. You know, I bury it and all those things. And, and you're absolutely right. You know, it, it, it's funny. I always say uh, sales is a lagging indicator of your customer experience, right? You know, and, and right now there's a lot of people benefiting from revenge spending and, you know, the coming out of the pandemic, but that too will pass. And how you're taking care of them right now will determine how busy you are in the spring and, and the rest of 2022 and into 2023. And you've given consultants, you've given executive suites, finally something that uh, gives some teeth to what they've always felt is a warm and fuzzy investment and you've proven it because you know any ceo that doesn't invest in customer experience does not understand the return what we call the return on experience and you know i did an article a couple months ago and saying what's what's a better return on investment advertising or customer experience training for your employees and the percentage well, the the actual math i think in the us i can't remember if it's globally or in the us was 500 billion is spent on advertising while 9 billion is spent on customer experience training. But then you have, you know, companies that achieve the highest net promoter score in their industry, you 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 share that over the past decade have an annual return of 26% or higher, which no one else gets close to. And and then I always go back to Tesla, right? The number one car company in the world spent zero dollars on advertising last year yet they earned in your book they earned the highest nps in the u.s automotive industry they're creating brand evangelists and and that's the you know i mean that's the least expensive and best marketing you can have yeah the philosophy behind the net promoter system actually i should go back to history i almost called it net lives enriched Yes. Because in, in essence, it's a balance sheet for every individual, every team, every company of all the lives I touch, how many are enriched, how many are diminished. That's promoters, detractors. So net lives enriched, net promoter score, it's the same thing. I decided to go with net promoter score because I thought business would would be more appealing. I'm not sure it was the wise choice, but it is. You know what, though? I, I, I loved when you said that in your book. But I agree with you, especially 20 years ago, and maybe even today, it's sad, right? That would have been too hokey, warm and fuzzy for the majority of businesses, uh, CEOs. You know, it's not, it didn't, doesn't feel right, right? And, and that's a sad thing. Yeah. You're, you're right. It was the right thing, but it, it wouldn't have probably gotten the traction it got. But every good person, whether in frontline, designing software, good people 
want to enrich the lives they touch. They can use the words, make the world a better place, you know, lighten people's loads, solve their problems, whatever their language is. They want to enrich lives. You don't have to link it to somebody's bonus. You just have to give them the feedback so they can be the kind of person they, they want to be and that they have evidence to push forward that, you know, we got policies and procedures that are not letting me accomplish the, the purpose of my life, uh, enriching lives. So net promoter doesn't need to be linked to compensation. However, to give credibility, I did do a lot of economic analysis. I mean, that's what my degree's in. So I showed when you measure net promoter correctly, and you have apples to apples comparisons across competitors in an industry, it's the ones at the top who are getting uh, extraordinary growth and profit generation. I And it, to make it really clear, I started investing my own money in these NPS leaders. And my stock portfolio has more than tripled the market over the last 10 years. So, And, you're, and you're, you say in your book that you focus solely on that they're top of industry NPS. That, that's how you choose your stock, right? Yeah, because people just cannot break out of an accounting framework. We, we use accounting numbers and finance to measure our success, to set bonuses, to hold people accountable. We control our organizations. We govern our organizations. So that accountant's model, the mindset, has crept in and controls us. And the objective function, when you look at the world through an accountant's lens, is profits. Or if you are a balance sheet kind of person, it's, it's uh, equity. And that's the same thing of it as uh, shareholder value. That's wrong. It's a second order benefit. The core is to treat your customers so they come back for more and bring their friends. It, when you enrich a life, if someone wants to share that with a loved one, with a friend or a family member, that referral is an act of love. And it's that is the evidence that love actually drives good business. And the reason I'm three times richer than the average Wall Street investor is because I have a way of measuring love. And, uh, and I do think how much you love your customers is how, mm, how not just how wealthy you get, but how happy you should be with what you've done with your life. And there's so many things I want to unpack there, a couple of things with what you were just talking about. When I follow you, I've read your books, I've written about you in my books. For some reason, Fred, I don't remember the vision and all that. I always looked for you as I needed hard data to support what we are uh, trying to get our, our consulting clients to invest in. And when I picked up this book, and, and I must have missed it, right? I'm always quoting and a 5% increase in your net promoter score can be, you know, all your great hard data. You're a guy from Harvard. You yeah, work at- I'm from Parma. I'm I know, I know. You're a Buckeye. You're a Buckeye. But- I, what, I do root for the Buckeyes because uh, yeah. for Harvard is a mixed uh, bag. <laughs> right, right. But what I knew about you from afar, and I followed you, but what I knew about you up until I, I picked up this book was, all right, this is a guy from Harvard, and this is a guy from, from Bain and Company. And he invented a net promoter score. So I, you know, I, I went to you for the, the hard data to prove, you know, our, our, our theories. And then when I pick up the book, I, I couldn't believe, you know, what you said, the uh, lives enriched. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, you know, I just wasn't expecting it. And I, I have so many quotes that just from your first couple chapters that I've been posting on LinkedIn and tagging you. And, you know, here's a cup I just love. Uh, great companies help people live great lives. They are a force for good. Great leaders build and sustain such communities. They inspire team members to forge lives of meaning and purpose through the service to others. And, 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 and the next quote, really, another one. Love, this is an awesome quote. Love is a state of caring so much for a person that most of your own happiness derives from increasing the person's happiness and well-being. I mean, that says it all. I, I, I love that. And, and I was totally caught off guard. You know, like I said, a Bain Harvard guy. I, I, I wasn't expecting it. You know, love is a four letter word in, in some societies and business. Yeah. And it was risky being as, uh, but when you get to this age, you, you have the say. credibility now. You have the, I don't know. I don't remember if you would talk, if you talk like that, you know, in your first book, but now you have the credibility and, and, and not that you didn't, but you know, you, you can say that and people will actually not discount it as that. 
And I, the, the book is dedicated to my uh, young granddaughters, uh, hopefully more grandchildren coming. And it's written as sort of a life, it's advice to people uh, about how to build relationships with the right kind of people, not because it makes you happy, but because you can be of service and create value. And it's that chain of service to others that, that makes communities successful. But it, it, there are bad people out there. So be really thoughtful about which relationships you invest in. You know, Choose your loyalties wisely. They not only guide your life, they define your legacy. And if our little infant grandchildren can uh, can follow that advice they're going to have a lot a lot uh, better lives right it's who we surround ourselves and the book you know does go it's for as much personally as it is professionally right and the same tactics and the same you know best practices of who you bring on your team who is you know chirping in your ear in your personal life and professional life and that's what i love it so how should we define a great co- well I, you said it that they that that, that their mission is yeah right that's how you define it to enrich the lives of others yeah but the cool thing about business is it's measurable you can actually you you don't just make it up in your own head about how good a person you are you can actually see i've enriched a life or i haven't based on not just their net promoter score that's a nice tool but when customers come back for more and especially when they refer their friends you know you've made their life better they, because that act of love of referring a friend is the total signal that you've hit pay dirt. And if you start focusing on that and remembering that's the true measure of success, it'll lead you down a much better path. You'll be more successful yourself. You'll be able to pick communities that you want to be part of and invest your life in, who you want to buy from, who you want to invest in, who, what you want to work for. These are vital life decisions, and we make them in this sloppy way with no data with net promoter and now earn growth the sister the twin metric to net promoter that i've introduced in yeah yep, we're gonna get to that yeah you really you have a much better picture of how you're doing with your life and who you want to be spending it with and and you know my is uh come the brand customers can't live without or clients or patients or whatever you know we call yeah. them and make price irrelevant. And and what I mean by making price irrelevant, it doesn't mean you could double your prices tomorrow and not lose existing and potential customers. But based on the experience your brand consistently delivers, your customers have no idea what your competition charges, right? You know, because they're not out price shopping you. And now a lot of people, I've been guilty of driving three extra miles to say 50 cents on something, not realizing I lost in that exchange. But I also have a few businesses, per se, profession that I'm so loyal to that when I recommend them, and I love what you say about recommending, it's co-branding and putting your reputation on the line. But when I recommend them, and you might say to me, well, John, how much do they charge? Sometimes I'm embarrassed. I don't know. Like, I really don't pay attention. I can go look up the receipt, but I, I don't care because I know well, they might be charging. The only, way, the only way that's really true is if you trust the company not to take advantage of you. Right. So I actually think the great companies are consistently giving you the very best value, the very best price they can, consistent with running a healthy community, paying their employees well, you know, investing in R&D and and creating great experiences. But they're always maximizing value to the customer, which is the opposite of most car dealers. Most car dealers I've met said, God, leaving a dollar on the table that I could have grabbed through another negotiating tactic, that's a failure. I want to keep 100% of the excess value and only give the absolute minimum value to the customer, which is why it's a horrible experience, because it's a difference in philosophy of what business is about. And back to what what was broken about how the business world broke or didn't do it right, the net promoter, NPS, you brought it up, and it's my biggest pet peeve. I've always said employees should be fired. If they beg you for, you know, in the car dealership, hey, you know, in the next week, you're going to get a call, you're going to get a survey, you know, we only accept fives, you got to give me a five. And, and, and it's so many more businesses are doing that these days. And there's nothing that is less professional, everything that you, you preach about in that way. Uh, my colleague, Rob Markey, likes to uh, describe that as fraud. Every, every time you're sort of fudging the data. Yeah, you should get fired. I have a slightly different point of view. I think it's the bosses who put people in that situation. So when I see 
a frontline person sort of begging or pleading or even talking about this, the survey, I just decide that is a poorly led company. I don't want to be a part of that community. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to talk about the companies that are achieving it. And one of my absolute favorite quotes, I think it was from Jerry Garcia, is you don't want to be known or it's not enough to be known as the best at what you do. You want to be known as the only person that does what you do. And I love that quote. And that's always been my obsession. And I think that the companies you're going to mention that you talk about in the book, it's kind of like that. Like if I, and you could ask anyone, you know, give me some phone companies and meaning uh, the people who make it. And, you know, everyone's going to say Apple and then they're going to think. And then the, the next two or three will be in different orders depending on your ass, right? Samsung, uh, Nokia, everyone's going to say, Lululemon or Amazon, and, and then the, you know when you go to that category, Peloton, it, it, they'll always be number one. And then you know they'll, they'll pause, and it'll be a random order depending on who you ask. And that's why I really think what you're helping companies drive is you're it. That's it. You know you want to use this person, this accountant, this law firm, this life insurance. So expand on that. Who's the ones that are crushing it, and why? Well, we, when you measure a net promoter carefully, and it's harder to measure than meets the eye. If, if you're a company and, you know, like, like your hair salons and you're asking your own customers and they know it's you asking for the result, it sort of biases who bothers to respond and actually makes them respond with a higher score than they would if it were uh, anonymous. The, the, the reason is people, you know, they don't want to get a stylist in trouble, but usually there's a problem with the way the system is working. And, and they don't want that to happen. So you get inflated scores and only promoters are responding because they're the ones that are going to take the time to try and help. Uh, so you get bogus scores. However, you can get big panels of customers and not let you know that you don't, you don't know who is the sponsor. So then you get honest answers. And we do that. The best guys with the scores in that process are Costco just crushes it. And of course, Costco is crushing it for their investors. Apple is is a well-known superstar. Enterprise Rent the Car is the best one in the car rental business. Vanguard Mutual Funds in that financial space. Of course, Vanguard is dedicated to making their their customers' lives better. That's their mutual. That all of their cash generation is from their own customers. And they've grown to have trillions and trillions of dollars in assets, not because they're trying to get rich for their investors. It's because they're serving their customers. I think those smaller Pelotons, the Warby Parkers, they're playing this same game. So I'm investing in them because over the years, uh, there's going to be ups and downs. But man, after 10 or 20 years, those are the guys that rule it financially because they have this magic flywheel working in their favor. Their customers are their sales force. So their customers are coming back, buying more stuff and referring their friends. And that's the little flywheel that accountants don't know how to measure but actually is the driver of long-term prosperity. Well, you talk about Warby Parker, who I love, uh, you know, got my, all my different pairs of glasses yeah. from them. Over 90% or nearly 90% of their new customers are from customer referrals and word of mouth. And, and just think about how many people waste, you know, millions, billions of dollars on advertising and don't A, take care of the customer the first time. It's just amazing to me. Have you ever considered being your own boss in a customer service career? If coaching businesses to service excellence excites you, CX Coaching may be the opportunity you've been dreaming about. Email Claudia at the DeJulius Group for more information. So we are speaking to Fred Reichel about his new book, Winning on Purpose, uh, The Unbeatable Strategy of Loving Customers. We are providing in the show notes the link to get the book and the link to follow Fred, you know, all that good stuff. Fred, one of the things, so you, had a, you caught me with a couple of things, which I like, that I'm like, when you, you say it the first time, I'm like, hey, wait a minute. And, and, and this has been a long time, you know, probably, uh, you know, you'd know better than me, but at least 20 years where people have been saying, the customer's number two, the employee's number one. And you actually buck that, which at first caught my attention saying, whoa, how do you justify that? Can you explain that where you're saying, no, the customer needs to be number one? Well, I think the leader's primary duty is to help make sure their teams, their frontline teams embrace 
the mission of enriching customer lives and that they're appropriately rewarded and recognized when they achieve that. But it's that the, the, the organization's mission needs to be focused on making customers' lives better. And the leader's job is to help his or her team members do that. But I think the, the flaw in this employees come first, that's just wrong. The reason a company exists, the reason great organizations exist to enrich the lives of customers. And um, the instant the employee thinks it's all about me, my, the leader's job is to make me happy, you get into this entitlement and uh, not really stretching to be of service and to innovate and take the risks. It, it, I mean, it's it's hard. And and a company just to, you know, if you make making employees happy your primary mission, you are going to be out of business within uh, a few years because a lot of things that make employees happy make customers very unhappy. Lots of vacations. I work the hours I want to work. I don't deal with customers who have difficult needs or problems that that make me struggle. That's you know that's a loser strategy, and and all the ping pong and beer refrigerators full of beer. That's not what makes a great company. Great companies help employees lead great lives. That and, and a great life is a, is a life of service to others. I love that. So how does this apply? How does NPS apply to uh, you know the Great Resignation? How do you tie it together? Oh, I, I think it has so much relevance. The, the notion, why are people resigning? Because they don't have purpose in their work. When, when you feel like you are, you're leading your life's purpose through your work, you don't quit. <laughs> you, you, found, you found nirvana. But just so many companies, they don't, they don't get this. They think, yeah, you work hard and I pay you to do a tough job. But if you want a purpose, go go work for Habitat for Humanity or go to church or something. And I think, no, a great business. That's the church you need <laughs> for the yeah. most part. Because you love thy neighbor as thyself. This is the basis of a well-lived life, whether you're in a church or non-secular or secular. Love thy neighbor as thyself is the core to a net promoter. Because when you feel the love, that's when you give people tens. That's when you give a standing ovation. The, to, to what they've done for you. And I think that's what drives most human beings. Not everybody. Some people are totally about the money, but I think good people are about service. And, and it so happens when you get that flywheel going where if customers are coming back for more and they bring their friends, that does make you wealthy. But that's the second order of benefit. And, and, and that, I think the pandemic or, or the great resignation is a wake-up call. I think you know the previous eight to 10 years, Leaders and companies got sloppy, and you know it was an employer market at the time. And you know it's brought back the most powerful tool great companies you know use is is purpose and tying people's job to the purpose. I just heard this is you got two types of employees: one that work for a paycheck and one that work for you know the mission and vision. And obviously, we may not have you know a hundred percent of them, but you absolutely want to select and groom them. And my other soapbox is great resignation that I get upset about is, you know, I say quit calling it a labor shortage. It's a, a turnover crisis. you know and 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 to me, the definition of a labor shortage is if we had more jobs ever available and less human beings to fill them. And that's not true. We have roughly the same amount of jobs available and roughly the same amount of human beings, but because we haven't been taking care of those human beings and doing the things like that you talk about, you know, they, they've had a professional awakening saying, you know, this ain't worth it. They, they know what they want. And they know what they aren't, they aren't willing to tolerate. Yeah, the, the companies that I have been writing about and continue to write about have always paid their people great. These are not minimum wage companies. You know, Costco overpays their, you right. look at the analyst reports, stock analysts with their mental model, they think they're overcompensating. Enterprise rent a car. The CEO keeps a list of how many people earn over $200,000 a year because they're proud of that. And they want that big to get, that book to get real big. Apple pays way above market, all of these. But then how do they give a good value to their customers if they're paying these great wages? because they are focused on making their customers' lives better. The way you earn great wages is by getting customers to come back for one and bring their friends. And that creates this incredible economic efficiency that generates cash flow that people don't get. I always go back to that original 
One of the early companies I wrote about was Chick-fil-A or Enterprise. These were tiny little niche players. And because they got the flywheel going, the Enterprise, for instance, is now the biggest car rental company on earth as a, as a private company. They didn't need the funny money from Mark Wall Street. They generate cash from customers' wallets the right way. And they're making their employees quite wealthy when they do a good job. That, that's This great resignation, I do think, is draining the water down so we can see where the rocks are. And if you don't have a meaningful purpose that ignites your employees, you can't really survive. Because especially in a digital world where you need young people who have digital skills, good luck. They they can work anywhere they want. And they can probably earn a pretty good paycheck anywhere they want. But to get the really good ones who are team players and care about their customers, you need to make it clear that you, the reason you exist is to make the world better for your customers. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Something that I need your help with, another thing, you talk about the golden roll lot. So yeah, this how is- poorly people understand it. Well, <laughs> so this, people, hopefully- um, so this is how what I've always said to my clients, it's been my opening lines, uh, all my speeches, is basically in a nutshell, the golden rule on its own is the worst compass to have for uh, your customer service. And what I mean by that is, you know, especially with frontline customer facing employees, you know, 18 to 24 year olds, they haven't had life experiences to know what world-class looks like. Most of us didn't, you grew up in Parma, right? We didn't stay at five-star resorts and fly first class and get a Mercedes Benz when we were 16. So I always say like, if you hired one of my three boys tomorrow, as soon as they get out of college and you say, Johnny, Cal, or Bo, you know, I want you to deliver world-class experience. That would be dangerous because to them, it might be a fist bump. It might be a, hey dude, you know, cause they don't know what world-class looks like. And we have to teach them that, you know, I didn't know what world-class looked like. You wouldn't have wanted my world-class experience at 19, 22, or 23. So help me merge that with your golden rule. Yeah, I think a lot of people have a, don't think about the golden rule the right way. There's a way of defining it that is pretty superficial and flawed, which is treat others the way you'd want to be treated. Yeah. I just, that that only works if someone's quite sophisticated and exactly. how they want to be treated. Right. So I, when I, in the book, I say, uh, let's not call it the platinum rule and all these other re- redefinitions. Just let's get it right. Love thy neighbor as thyself. That's the basis of it. Not treat others the way you want to be treated. Love thy neighbor. Mean, and when you love someone, you want them to, you care about their happiness and their well-being. And you want it you know, that's, you want to maximize that. That's what love is. So if you think of the golden rule in that sense, then it's the right met, it's the right way. And that promoter becomes the metric with this act of love of referring a friend lets you know, they felt the love your customer felt like they've been treated really well, remarkably well, so remarkably that, and, and so consistently that they're willing to go out and trust their own reputation and recommend you to a friend. Right. That's a pretty cool. That's a pretty cool standard. Yeah, I love your version. Treat the customer how you'd want a loved one to be treated. That changes but, you it. You know, for there's me. a good one. A practical way. If if you know Jesus and the love gospel isn't doesn't fit, treat people the way you would want a loved one treated. You know, right. if you're in a hospital, and you're they're treating your dear old mother or your one of your kids, someone you really care about. That's the standard of treatment that uh, that I think more people can relate to. No, I, I love that version because, again, what a 22-year-old, the way he likes to be treated, he may have only shopped at the Gap or uh, TGI Fridays or whatever, so he doesn't know what world-class looks like. But I love that one. Two really important questions I want to make sure I get to. Again, we're talking to Fred Wright Cal about his new book, Winning on Purpose, The Unbeatable Strategy of Loving Customers, the link to get the book. And to follow Fred and more information will, is in the show notes. So uh, my, my last two questions here, Fred, is, um, and I really like this, because another thing I used to say, uh, uh, my, my only, I guess, you know, thing I used to say about MPS is, I, I don't want to know what people intend to do. I want to know what they're actually doing, right? And, and so if you have a business that can track referrals, 
that's even more important than the intention to refer. And not everyone has a business like that, but I love being able to show all my consultants, you know, that 12% of your clients have referred. 30% of your clients have referred. So I think this is where it leads with the, your, your new KPI that I think is going to be as powerful as NPS is earned growth rate, also called EGR. Tell our listeners about that. Yeah, I've uh, partly as a frustration that people kept linking net promoter score to people's uh, bonuses and making yep. it a KPI. I, I, I figured it out I just couldn't stop that. So I had to come up with a better alternative that they would use instead. And, and that better alternative I call earned growth. It's just very simply keeping track of all of your revenue and growth, how much is coming from existing customers coming back for more, and how much is coming from them referring their friends. And, and most companies can't measure either of those very carefully, right. but the first one will be easier. The second one, they just have to track referrals. And one of the ways we found to be very practical to know your new customers, if you're going to split them into earn through referrals versus bought, advertising, sales, commission, special promotions, gimmicks, the earned ones, when they come in and set, you're setting them up as a new customer, you just have to ask them one question. What's the primary yeah. reason you, you chose us to do business right. with us? And, and if referral and recommendation is one of the options, right. you know, very few companies do that today. I hope within the decade, all companies will do that because actually keeping track of referrals is vital. It, is, I, you know, it sounds like we're talking like 1960, that very few companies, and I know you're right, but it just blows my mind that that isn't an, an obsessive KPI that everyone isn't tracking. It's not in generally accepted accounting principles. In fact, GAF, where, you know, you get to, I know small entrepreneurs are, accounting is not what drives yes. their thinking. But the instant you get to be big, accounting becomes how you communicate, how you measure. And, and generally accepted accounting principles don't even keep track of how many customers you have, let alone whether they're coming back for more or referring their friends. It's just, it's common sense, but it's not measured. And therefore it hasn't become part of the business science. It's not taught in MBA programs. But the most basic CRM systems can do that for you. Not from, a, not, maybe not from the, well, they could, right? Because you, when you're adding, you know, Fred Reichel as a new customer and, and you have that, it doesn't let you proceed without saying where he came from. And then you should, you know, all the CRM systems, we, in the salon industry 25 years ago, we did this. And then we're able well, to run. always asking, when there's a human in there, there's right. common sense, then it's easy to figure out why they came. And so, yeah, it's, you know. And then you could run reports off of it, right? And But I would even think in, in the digital world, that should be a field that, you know, you can't it get by. It will be solved. It, it, it has not been solved yet, I'll guarantee that. But I... I know a lot of guys are talking to me and it will be solved shortly. Uh, Fred, the last question I ask you is, so I do believe people, managers, leaders, CEOs, department heads, whatever we call them, and even customer facing employees need to be losing sleep at night over the customer experience. And so how, you know, how can you incentivize? Cause you said that that kind of bastardized the NPS back in the day. So how can you walk that fine line of, you know, keeping a fire lit under people without making a gaming and, you know, unintended consequences? I think you should go back to the original language of Net Lives Enriched and say, we're, we're doing one of the great favors that a business, that any community could do for you. We're helping you keep a personal balance sheet of, of all the lives you touch, how many are enriched, how many are diminished. Uh, primarily that's for you to help you be a better person and make sure the purpose of your life is one you're proud of. And then in that wrapping, let people know the data. I don't even think you have to embarrass them with rank orderings. I mean, you, yeah, let them know where they stack up themselves, but don't put their name on the door and humiliate them. This is an act of love. You're trying to help your people be better people. <laughs> And, and so the, the best system I've seen actually picks a phone call that went badly and a phone call that went well. Artificial intelligence picks those for you, plays them for the customer service rep. They get to figure out what the lesson learned is and go forward. But they're always judging their own worth as a person of their net lives enriched feedback. That 
once you've established that meaning behind it, you don't need to link. AKA to NPS, right? Yeah, net promoter. It's a pretty powerful idea. I, I can now measure whether I lived up to the golden rule or not. One person, one customer at a time. It's very powerful. I now, you know, ask me why everybody is confused about the golden rule because nobody measures it. We don't, until you measure something, it never becomes a science. You have no rigorous definitions. And, and by measuring, you suddenly make it real. And I think net promoter, if it does nothing else, when it's done right, it makes the golden rule real. And so would you caution leaders to tie a KPI of NPS or if they can actually track the, you know, EGR, earn growth rate, to a, a, an incentive? Um, a oh, I, that understates it. I would, I, I couldn't, I mean, I, I don't have the words that I could say in a podcast that right. I think about that practice. It's, it's evil. It's well-intentioned, but it is destroying the nature of love. It, it means that you just don't care about your people. You, you have this flawed financial KPI. If we don't measure it, we can't manage it. No, uh, there are some measures that uh, people will do the right thing. And then if you have to link it and make it public, do it for a team. Don't do it for an individual because teams can handle this. There are a few companies, T-Mobile is one example that, that gets net promoter scores for their team and they link it to compensation in a light touch. And it works because they got the right culture. And when teams feel like the solutions to make them better need help from corporate, the corporate gives it to them. Uh, so, it, but that's, that's one of the, you know, that's the top 10% culture. Most companies have a purpose of making money. And when your purpose is making money, how's your team going to trust you right. to really prioritize their calls for help to help them do better with their customers? Yeah, it's it's a shocking even after all these years and and that that has to be a sales pitch, right? That, that the customer yeah. experience. And start using earned growth. You know, read, the, it's a Harvard Business Review article. There's a chapter in the book. Earned growth is meant to be a KPI that you link people's compensation to. That is where I would put the energy. And then that promoter is just a tool to help you do better. All right, three rapid round questions. You're uh, living in Massachusetts. You've been there for, uh, it's, I think, uh, most of your adult life. Have you ever taken the duck tour? No, <laughs> never. I was thinking I've done it four it's times. <laughs> it's the greatest thing. It's the greatest thing in the world. But like, like that, I haven't been to like even the Cleveland Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because it's local. Uh, oh, when's no, the last time I've been there. That's, that's worth a trip. That's, right, that's a right. When's the last time you've been to Cleveland? Oh, boy. Pre-COVID, my bro brother lives there, so we try to get back. But it's it's been sadly a long time since we've been in this uh, this lockdown environment. Yeah, yeah. Well, so you, you've seen it change a lot since you, uh, you oh, graduated. Oh, incredible. It's great. Hey, when it's I great. left Cleveland, when I graduated from high school, that was when the Cuyahoga River caught on yeah. fire. It was a tough time. We still but, get uh, our, our our jokes. Ah, oh, the mistake on the lake and all. But it's a great it's a great city. I'm I'm very proud of it as 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 you are. Are you a baseball fan? Yeah. All right. This is a tough question. Um, uh, DH or no DH? Oh, DH for sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm like no one wants to see a pitcher hit. Do you want to make baseball a little bit more boring than? It oh is? my god! Yeah, Watching them try to bunt three pitches in a row. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Fred. I I personally want to thank you for what you've meant to me my career you've made me look smarter in my books and in my consulting because i've quoted you and my old adage is if you take one thing from someone it's plagiarism if you take a dozen it's research and and you know that's that's what you've given me a lot of great data i love this new book winning on purpose and it, it is it is so much to do with um, you know, personal life, just being a world-class human being, let alone uh, business. So thanks for your time. Thanks for being here. The next time you're in Cleveland, please let me uh, take you out for uh, a great dinner. Or if you want to send your niece to one of our spas, it'll be on me. Thank you, Fred. My pleasure. It's been fun, John. And thank you, Revolutionaries, for another episode of the Customer Service Revolution Podcast. We will see you next week. 
Thanks for listening in to this episode of the Customer Service Revolution podcast. I'm Denise Thompson, Managing Partner of the DeJulius Group, and I invite you to send us your questions, post a review, and let us know what you liked and want to hear more of. We're happy that you're part of the Customer Service Revolution and encourage you to subscribe now so you don't miss an episode. You'll find us on Spotify, iTunes, or your favorite podcast station. 